Um, so welcome everyone to our new session of our 50 plus shades of Gothic conference and today we are having the first panel for the section bodies and boundaries plus gender sexuality and the Gothic. So first of all, I want to thank our public for joining us today, as well as our panelists for sharing their work with us. And I'll begin by reminding you that the public should keep their microphones and cameras off during the presentations and we will have the Q&A session at the end um, to ask questions to all our pan panelists together at the same time so we can have a conversation hopefully amongst, amongst them. And also, the, and this will be reminded later, but in order to ask a question, uh, you can use the raise hand uh, tool button that you have in the reaction section at the bottom of your screens. And also, um, and then I will give you access so you can turn on your mic and camera. And as this session is being recorded and will be later uploaded to our YouTube channel, if you don't want your face being recorded, you can also write your question in the chat. So now I will begin by introducing our first speaker today, who is Rachel Harper. Uh, she has just graduated this May from the University of Tennessee with a Master's of Arts in English Literature. Her research interests include ecofeminist criticism, fictional portrayals of sexuality, especially in terms of the female body and the Gothic genre. And she's going to share with us today her work entitled Sexuality, Danger and the Gothic. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and start sharing my screen here. I've got a little presentation to go along with it so you guys can kind of follow along visually. Okay, so today I'm going to be looking at the conflation of sexuality and danger within the Gothic genre. Um, and by looking at Gothic fiction spanning nearly a century, I'm researching what makes this fusion of sex and fear so inextricable as well as popular and what role gender plays in the writing of this kind of hunter-prey binary that we see in the genre. So the novels we're going to be looking at briefly are Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, John Polidori's The Vampire, Bram Stoker's Dracula, Stephanie Meyer's Twilight, and E.L. James's Fifty Shades of Grey. So starting with Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, um, Shelley manages to turn the trope of the sexualized genre on its head from Frankenstein's very conception. Rather than placing the female as the object of danger thrust upon her by the dark masculine figure, Shelley chooses to place a male in the midst of a very feminine fear, that of birth. Gynocriticist Ellen Moores in her essay, Female Gothic, The Mother's Monster, suggests that Frankenstein seems to be distinctly a woman's myth-making myth-making on the subject of birth precisely because of its emphasis on the trauma of the afterbirth. So as a result of this false sense of conception, Frankenstein takes on the role of the mother giving birth to a new life. However, he quickly abandons his own creation out of the fear resulting from his new role of responsible parent. Uh, Frankenstein's intimacy, however, is not with a woman, but with science, a relationship devoid of any inherent sexuality. So in the case of Shelley's work, the reader witnesses a man who desires to create, which is typically a natural process through the strangely absent act of intercourse, a life that Frankenstein then runs from in disgust, um, a creation both desired and feared. So I argue that sex in Frankenstein quite literally birthed the very personification of fear. So as I said, the sex that births this construction of fear is not organic, but it's scientific. Um, a scientific eroticism which reveals another method Shelley employs to subvert the expectations of inherent sexual danger in a gothic novel. Another critic, Anne K. Miller, in Possessing Nature, the Female in Frankenstein, writes that Frankenstein's scientific penetration and technological exploitations of female nature is only one dimension of a more general cultural encoding of the female as passive and possessible um, as the willing receptacle of male desire. So with Frankenstein's conception of life still understood as a form of penetration, um, an intrusion on the natural workings of women's bodies, then I argue that the fear is in fact still written as projected onto femininity via the symbolic figures of masculinity. 
So rather than writing these tropes explicitly into the nature or actions of the characters, Shelley implicitly ties the dangers of a masculine reproducing society potentially overtaking, metaphorically raping, the nature of women. So the fact that Frankenstein is a man asexually producing a male life is not one to go unnoticed. So Meller goes on um, arguing that one of the deepest horrors of this novel is Frankenstein's implicit goal of creating a society for men only. Um, Frankenstein is male, his creature is male, he refuses to create a female, so there's no reason that the race of immortal beings he hopes to propagate should not be exclusively male. Um, sex and reproduction are inexplicable. So Shelley's intentional absence of a primary female character in the text itself showcases the true horrors existing in the web of sexuality for both females and for males, um, the erasure of sexual autonomy, and the loss of sexual dominance, respectively. So Frankenstein is confronted by such a masculine fear when his creation asks of him a mate. While Frankenstein masks his fear of female sensuality behind a fear for humankind, as you can see on this slide here, his true emotions are implicit in his musings. Um, Frankenstein's fear is, like Meller argued, of an independent female will, that his female creature will have desires and opinions that cannot be controlled by the male creature. He's afraid of her reproductive powers, so ultimately what he truly fears is female sexuality. Thus, the true figure of masculine power is still the character that holds the ability to use his sex, whether through a perverted form of conception or as a comparative tool to emasculate, to alter the lives around him as people fall victim to the consequences of the dark and dangerous side of his personality that obstructs the necessity of a woman in the maintenance of life. So moving forward, while Shelley's text implicitly links sex and fear, Polidori's The Vampire contains language that explicitly refers to the sexual prowess utilized by the vampire, Lord Ruthven, when hunting for his prey, prey that is perpetually female. The Byronic figure, in this case, Ruffin, manipulates a woman's sense of self in order to prey on her body. Ruffin gives a woman a sense of control and importance, enabling her to feel both desired and necessary for the redemption of the Byronic figure, only to twist that purity of intention in on itself. So the women are not merely deceived in their allowance to feel, possibly for the first time, their own sexual dominance, but they're turned into the defenseless prey of the true dominant, uh, dominant, the masculine figure of sexual energy. In Polidori's story, vampires are written as the epitomes of threatening sexual energy. Um, just as in Frankenstein, the thought of seduction is conflated with that of danger for society. And this sort of mindset reflects the tendency of the Romantic period to critique the Enlightenment's strict adherence to reason and intellect in favor of emotional and sensual experience. So in that way, the Gothic could be read as a satire of earlier society's strict sensibilities, literally converting the danger and shame associated with sex into a monstrous idea. And not only is the feeding of the vampires the result of an unholy type of seduction, but the very act itself is described less as a murder and more as an act of passion. Um, for example, vampires in literature typically feed from the neck, but visually this feeding could easily be compared to a lover's kiss on the throat. Um, but the fear present on the usually vic uh, female victim's countenance is often mistaken for ecstasy. So particularly in an age combating the previous res uh, reservations surrounding sex, the blatant sexuality emanating from a figure such as Lord Ruffin um, conveys upon women the illusion of freedom from societal expectations and a promise of sexual awakening and liberation. Uh, rebelling against social norms and risking one's reputation in that time period, much as in now, is often a source of anxiety and fear, which is a notion embodied in the inherent sexual offering emanating from many Byronic figures throughout Gothic fiction. Um, Dracula, moving on with the vampire stories, uh, was perhaps one of the most iconic of vampires and was Stoker's sensational monstrous creation and is often read as the ultimate seducer. The actions of a vampire, many of which are derived from this classic novel are incredibly erotic, with a typically sexualized vampire feasting on the neck of an attractive victim, often in a scene either implying or explicitly introducing a sexual encounter. Stoker's most sexually explicit scene occurs when Jonathan Harker has been surrounded and nearly seduced by the female vampires within Dracula's castle. In contrast to the aged Dracula, these women appear to be the apex of sexual appeal, utilizing their sexuality to lure Jonathan to his demise. 
You can see a quoted example on the slide here. Clearly, the novel is written in a fashion that could be labeled as erotic fiction in parts, but it skirts the notion of pornography entirely. Um, it's also noteworthy that this scene occurs near the beginning of the novel's plot. So from the beginning, the reader is expected to view the vampires as a source of erotic energy. Um, as such, the whole of the story is constructed around an ideal predator, one that hunts by luring his or her prey through the entrapment of sexual enticement. Um, so as a subversion of the time period's gendered expectations, Stephanie Dimitrikopoulos and feminism, sex role exchanges, and other subliminal fantasies in Bram Stoker's Dracula, Dracula notes how the female vampires in this novel totally reject any notions of motherhood. They feed off children and reduce men to nothing more than their sexual capabilities, which turns the sexual woman into the hunter and the male into the prey. Uh, the men being sought after in the novel display an imminent desire to give in to the advancements of the women, and these fates are narrowly missed via outside intervention. Um, but it's important to remember that all the female vampires in the novel were originally humans converted by Dracula, so their liberation consists of turning against normative propriety and utilizing their sexuality in the ultimate hunting game against the very men that demonized their sexuality in the first place. Uh, furthermore, the erotics represented in Dracula are often presented as seductions of the mind just as much as the body. So the fear manifested in the mind is suspended as desire takes over, um, which converts the danger of the vampire's feeding into a seductive call to subvert the expectations of sex as a means to reproduce and enter parenthood. So before jumping forward, I'm just going to reiterate again that up to this point, fear and sexuality seem to be inherently linked largely due to the constraints that are implicit within a sexually conservative society of the time period. But in modernity with these constraints, um, not so much in the forefront of society's mind. Um, now we're gonna look at what imposes this notion of fear into the erotic uh, fiction produced now and why it's so sought after and popularly translated as sexy. Um, so one example of a modern work of dangerous sexuality is Stephanie Meyer's Twilight the first in a saga of stories surrounding a young woman, Bella, caught in a love triangle with a vampire and a werewolf. Um, but Meyer takes her gothic themes of darkness and sex a little bit further because not only does Bella recognize the dangerous situation Edward places her in, but she actively seeks it out and experiences sexual attraction in the notion that she might not be entirely safe. Um, Edward believes this is because, quote, you need a healthy dose of fear. Nothing could be more beneficial for you. So despite the obvious red flags raised by a relationship with someone who is a proponent of fear, the reader is encouraged to side with Bella, uh, wanting the female protagonist to pursue a relationship with one of the two men in the story that could actually cause her the most amount of harm. So not only does this paint a negative portrayal of a healthy relationship for young readers, but Bella is also allowed little to no subjectivity in the novel. Her every thought and action is centered around desire for a male character, and Meyer's concentration on forming a relational bond for a woman, not even yet of age, um, with a man or a monster that quite literally stalks her through her daily life, only creates a very explicit anti-feminist misogynistic story in which sex is not only conflated with danger, but sex itself is dangerous. There are many instances throughout the novel in which Bella's life is put in immediate danger by way of Edward's lack of self-control, um, and while there is nothing more gothic than the presence of some sort of evil throughout the story, Meyer has managed to turn that evil into something seductive and desirous, even to the reader. Um, but another element of the gothic is the presence of the uncanny, which is a tool used in which the familiar is made unfamiliar and the comfortable is rendered uncomfortable. So maybe the conflation of sex and fear is actually a very brilliant use of the gothic genre. Um, drawing on the audience's inherent desire to be close to things that frighten us, especially for the reader in a vicarious fashion through the characters, so the reader maintains a deeper sense of safety, is a large portion of why the gothic genre works so well. Um, Kim Edwards in Good Looks and Sex Symbols argues that the reason people feel the need to be close to things that are terrifying in the first place is a direct result of the human desire to be seen or an attraction to looking at and being looked at. But the gaze functions in many different ways in Twilight, and I would argue that two of the main presences of the gaze are that of the gaze of the uh, desire and the male gaze. So in Twilight, Meyer combines these two gazes in a way that's detrimental to female readers um, in particular. 
So Bella is continually looking at Edward, the source of her danger and her desire, and Edward is continually looking at Bella without her consent. Um, Bella's object of desire then becomes the very thing that prohibits her from living a life of free will without the surveillance of the male gaze. Instead, Bella is magnetized to her source of danger, which is showcased um, in the slide here. Bella not only acknowledges the power Edward's danger has over her, but she also admits to being locked within his gaze. So Meyer has elected to equate the male gaze with danger and voyeurism, but she does so in a way that sensualizes the notion of control. Um, so Meyer's book, unlike previous Gothic works, is targeted specifically to a younger audience. So young impressionable women could romanticize the presence of danger or even of violence in their relationships. And in this way, Meyer is potentially transposing Gothic elements onto the real lives of readers, bringing the potential horror of the storyline to real life. Um, so lastly, another Gothic work that has potentially dangerous consequences to the readers is E.L. James' Fifty Shade, uh, Shades of Grey, which was originally a work of Twilight fan fiction. And the monster in this text is actually very much human, Christian Grey. Um, the similarities between Edward and Christian, despite their difference in species, lie mostly in their foundational Byronic characteristics. But what is it about these broken but confident men that seem to so surely attract the female characters to them, even against their better judgment. Um, it could be another example of the uncanny within the text, which is desiring the undesirable. And I would argue that the women's attraction to a fearful masculine monster is exacerbated by the fear present in the man of a woman able to control her own sexuality. For example, in Fifty Shades of Grey, the reader sees a male character who is entirely unable to relinquish control over his own body or the body of his lover, again, showcased on the slide here. And James writes many explicit examples of sexual satisfaction, not only conflated with danger, um, but as the direct result of danger or pain through the entire novel. So you have the uncanny displacement of familiar sensations of fear and pain, typically avoided, becoming the object of one's desire. So during the publication of the earlier works discussed, any mention of sexually explicit content was considered taboo. So the focus of the novel was mainly on the elements of fear with sexual energy running its undercurrents in the plot and the characters. Now the storylines rely on sexually explicit material, which has foundations of danger or pain. So in other words, I think the danger is no longer sexy, but the sex is dangerous. The reader is no longer simply experiencing danger vicariously through the characters, but notions of passivity are instilled into female readers while male readers are validated in a sense of mastery and control over the female body. And in this way, James has managed to make a parody of the original Gothic by turning the monster into a seemingly average man capable of atrocity. Rather than a dangerous plotline, James transposes the danger onto the real life consequences for the reader by perpetuating unhealthy stereotypes and hierarchical structures. So she captivates the readers by presenting an uncanny representation of love, propelling the fame of the Gothic genre through her use of Byronic figures, dark themes, and a strong element of the unknown or the misunderstood. Thank you, that is my brief foray through a century of uh, Gothic literature. I appreciate you guys pulling these out with me. Thank you so much, Rachel. That was a very interesting review of the history indeed. So we're going to move on to our next presenter now, who is uh, Maya Felvidea Paniagua. Uh, she's an associate professor of literature from English speaking countries at Complutense University of Madrid. Her research interests revolve around romantic and Gothic literature, feminist electronic literature, and psychoanalytic literary criticism. And she is going to present today her work entitled The Gothic as a Rebellion Against Social Norms in Erotic Fiction. Thank you, Laura. All right. So, um, yes, to start, I will uh, talk about um, the super sensual or martyr in Venus in Furs. Um, Um, yes, um, in Venus in First by Sasser Masoch. And um, yes, 
in this uh, story, we can see the, um, the case in which there is a didactic idea in the end that when there is, a, there is an imbalance of power between men and women, there is not a healthy relationship. And because of the religious restrictions, sexuality has been considered as something um, uh, dirty and, and unnatural. And this is how in, uh, in Gothic fiction and in erotic literature, we are going to see in this conference that it is from the darkness that characters explain their um, position because they are ill-treated and they, they express sublime feelings of fear and of um, sexuality. In the story of the eye by Georges Bataille, we have an eye and an egg which are related to the sexual genitals. It is a story of two children, the unknown narrator and Simone, who have strange sexual relationships. They meet an innocent girl called Marcel and they make a menage a trois. One day they make an orgy and uh, we can see that also the couple flee to Spain later with a voyeuristic Englishman for fear of being searched by the police. From the beginning of the story, the adolescents discover sexuality in a very symbolic way. The erotic elements such as Simon's black pinafore and the cat's saucer with milk are full of poetic symbolism. A hot summer afternoon, Simon makes a dirty and imaginative suggestion to the unknown narrator Milk is for the pussy, isn't it? said Simone. Do you dare me to see it in the saucer? The pussy is used as a symbol of a cat and milk as a clear metaphor of seeds. The strange act in which Simone wets her pussy with milk can be understood as a female provocation of desire of receiving seeds. Simone is a wild girl, she's like a cat, licking milk. The whole text produces an horrific sensation to the readers, being full of surrealism as well as impossible and absurd acts. There are different stages of time in the same paragraph, which provides a strange process of time, just like in dreams, thoughts of souvenirs. Simone plays the mistress role in the whole narrative, like in Venice in Furs. She doesn't let the narrator masturbate without being with her. The threesome scene in which both Simone and Marcel give pleasure to the narrator must be a reproduction of a female fantasy. When the couple tries to save Marcel from the castle where she is, She, we can see that she has a mental breakdown and the castle is used as a gothic element in which we can see that this story is a fantastic one. And Simone cries tears of joy when she sees Marcel in the castle. And Marcel says the narrator that he will protect her until the cardinal comes. But then she remembers the orgy in which she had a mental breakdown, realizes that the man she called the cardinal is the narrator and she hangs herself. The fact that Marcel fears a man, she calls the cardinal gives the idea that the author is trying to express the conception of religious men as those who historically have made women fear being punished when enjoying a sexual act. After Marcel's death, there is a combination of Eros and Thanatos when Simone and the narrator make love. I cut the rope that she was quite dead. It was very painful for both of us, but we were glad precisely because it was painful, end of quotation. The protagonist having a hard on can be understood as a sign of how male's excitement is not under his own control. In the last chapters of the book, when they flee to Spain at the beginning, Simone is traumatized because of Marcel's death. 
Simone uh, makes uh, fun and satirizes uh, in, in the church and she mocks religion. In the story of the eye, when we read about the X, it may remind us to Salvador Dali's paintings of X in which they represent life, sex, and womb. According to Roland Barthes, in his essay, The Metaphor of the Eye, this erotic literary work by Bataille is a poem and not a story because the protagonist of the story is not a person, but an object, the eye. For Barthes, another stylistic device that Bataille uses with the eye is metonymy. According to Baths, if we call metonymy this transfer of meaning from one chain to the other at different levels of metaphor, the eye sucked like a breast, drinking my left eye between her lips, we should probably concede that Bataille's eroticism is essentially metonymic. I consider the story of the eye as a therapeutical confessional narrative, an original genre, which could be called imaginary erotic gothic biography, because the author took some inspiration to imagine the character's scatological acts from his personal life. His father was paralyzed and was obliged to defecate in front of his own son and his mother suffered from a bipolar disorder like the female characters of the story. Pain and death are understood as unavoidable in human life. The protagonist's bizarre sexual acts are signs of liberation. Then we are going to move to a comparative study of Story of O by Pauline Reage and Fifty Shades of Grey. Story of O could be considered a fairy tale for another world. The story is told like if it were a fantastic Gothic narrative. It's similar to some extent to Lewis Carroll Alice in Wonderland, and it is disturbing to fantastic, surrealist, absurd, and unreal. The same kind of unbelievable plot is found in Fifty Shades of Grey. In Fifty Shades of Grey, the female protagonist doesn't understand why she felt pain the first time she experienced spanking, but then she remembers it as something pleasant, similar to the protagonist of Story of O. In erotic literature, both pleasure and pain are experienced by the body and cannot be explained with logic. This is why Gothic element is present because it is used to express the unconsciousness. Both Story of I and Fifty Shades of Grey uncover secret female fantasies of submission. According to Pauline Reage, Story of O was written when she was 47 and it was based on her own fantasies. In both novels, the female protagonist loses herself and her power on her own body. Although both books are about women's submission, they have been written in very different circumstances and with different purposes. The real name of the author of Story of O was Anne de Clos, but when Reage was only a pseudonym, she declared that she had written a book to impress Jean Paulin, another writer she loved. Story of O was a personal book in which the author described how we can see degradation and sacrifice as religious acts for love. Susan Sontag analyzed a story of O comparing sexual obsession with religious obsession in the pornographic imagination. However, Fifty Shades of Grey started as a Twilight fan fiction and it has been labeled as mommy porn. It has had an enormous success because of all the internet advertising invested and oppositely to Story of O, it has been poorly written with a simple and colloquial style. While sexual fantasies in fiction may be exciting for readers, they, uh, with these violent sadomasochistic relationships, can end up in lack of self esteem, depression, illness, and mental disorders. In present day electronic literature, women, men, and intersexual rights are reflected in words like Francesca da Rimini's Doll Space, in which we can see cyber gothic as a rebellion against patriarchy. With regards to Doll Space, from 1997, it explores the dimensions of power, submission, and sexual transgression. The author read Sasser Masoch's Venus in First, Vatai's Story of the Eye, and the Said to collect a series of narratives about blasphemy. In Francesca de Rimini's words, I start the quotation, 
This works influenced me, particularly the Said, who used the tropes of sexual excess and violently cruelty as a lens to reveal the workings of external forms of power as imposed by the state, the church, the judiciary, end of quote. In those spaces, stream sexual acts are visualized and verbalized to express how some sexual acts can end with death because the individual can be aware of his or her own notion of the self for love experience and at the same time can lose her own self in the painful loving or sexual act. Sigmund Freud in Beyond the Place of Principle highlighted the important relationship between Eros and Thanatos. Being both Eros or the libido and Thanatos, the death instinct, the forces that drive humans to act. In those space, there is a discourse full of frustration and rats showed, showing the obscurity, negativity and dangers of sexual practices in which the possibility of dying is involved. The carnival imagery in doll space images exemplifies how in cyberspace internet users practice cross-dressing and share the, with unknown users their erotic fantasies. The enjoyment of sexual pleasure of internet users who pretend to be a different person using false names is compared with the behavior of those people who wear masks, use wigs and wear makeup to play having a different gender. In doll space, the politicizing the concept of the carnivalesque creates a non-hierarchical coexistence of many potentially contradictory points of view in a society. Fertility cults have always occurred in calendric circles or as rites of passage within the life cycle. So to conclude, I would like to say that we can find uh, that Gothic elements are used in erotic fiction because those who are ill-treated or discriminated raise their voices from the dark and their unconscious part. We need to write and read novels written by women in which the submissive woman is empowered. She can choose her by herself and is not being abused by her partner as in Fifty Shades of Grey. Are we going to find erotic literature where there is mutual consent and respect in the next years, or should we continue criticizing the risks of gender violence that promote novels with pornographic and sexist content, like Fifty Shades of Grey? Maybe it is time to write erotic uh, Gothic literature by ourselves, a type of erotic in which there are not conventionalisms, obscurity, objectification of the bodies. Love and sex are not considered a strict religion or cult, and there is no elitism or sexism. An erotic literary work based on equality rights could also be successful. Thank you very much. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Maya. That was very interesting. And thank you for that critique of erotic fiction. I'm sure it connects very well with the rest of the presentations here. We'll have many questions. We are going to move on to our next presenter, Elva Maria Fuentes Muñoz. She obtained her English BA in the University of Almería and later earned a comparative literature MA from the University of Granada. Her preferred research fields are LGBT and gender studies, the Gothic and media studies, and she combined them all in her master's thesis on lesbian representation in the web series adaptation of Carmilla, which is the subject of her presentation today. Entitled Love Will Have Its Sacrifices, the Evolution of Lesbian Representation in the Transmedia Web Series Adaptation of Carmilla by Sheridan Lefany. And I'm gonna share the presentation. Okay, so as Laura said previously, and also thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be here today with you. I really appreciate it. Uh, as Laura said before, my presentation is on Mm, it's a comparison on the way that less sapphic women are portrayed in the original uh, work of Le Fanon, Carmilla, and the adaptation that was um, that aired in 2014 as a YouTube web series. So, next slide, please. So, I think that it was worth trying to see the, the reason why. The idea of a vampire lesbian start in the first place. So the evil lesbian, which is actually a trope that is uh, recognized in, in European literature since like 
twist to a couple of centuries ago. It all starts apparently because of the writings of Henry Latouche, Fragoleta. And after that, some other people, which will be uh, the majority of them French writers, the Phil Gautier and von Ray Balsat, took this example and introduced the character in their writings. The technical name of the stereotype is the transgressive woman. At least uh, Lillian Federman defined it as the transgressive woman whose acts infuriated the men writing uh, about her. And at first, it, was, it wasn't an image that was linked to uh, supernatural forces. And actually, for Lillian Federman in particular, the, um, the moment in which the whole idea of the evil lesbian and the supernatural lesbian came together would be in the, publi in the publication of the Flos de Mel by Charles Baudelaire which was like in around the middle of the 18th of the 19th century. But the thing is that Carmilla, that it's actually an evil lesbian, it's a vampire lesbian, is not directly linked to this book. Instead, the most important uh, president of the character would be Gerardine, the antagonist in Christabel, in Samuel Taylor Coleridge's poem Christabel that was published in 1816, which is actually mm, a lot of years before the publication of The Flowers of Evil. So it is very interesting to think about the roots, the ideas that were already in the mind of the writer, in the psyche of the people of the 19th century that led to two writers that had nothing in common having a very similar idea in two completely different cultures. And actually, a lot of people think that Carmilla is a rendition in prose of Christabel, so it is really worth mentioning this work when talking about the novella, also because it features sapphic content as well, although it's, mm, it's been regarded as ambiguous and not that clear. And a lot of people have been trying to ignore it while addressing it academically, but it's, uh, there is like a clear, almost sexual, we could even say sexual, um, change between the two protagonists. Next slide, please. So, in contrast to Christabel's representation, which was, as I said, like for a lot of time, um, like, not taking in account in a lot of literary analysis. Carmilla's uh, lesbian and sapphic representation is like accepted by most of the important scholars that had addressed the work. However, that doesn't mean that the representation in the book is positive, actually it's far from positive. Mm, there are several things to take in account when addressing lesbian representation in Carmilla, but we, if we had to, sum it up in three like three point three valid points you know first problem would be like the most obvious is that the safi woman is a vampire for example like that's like the keystone actually actually carmilla is the um, the core template for all the lesbian vampires that came afterwards even if i even if she wasn't actually the first one because Geraldine had vampiric traces as well but the thing is that she became the core template and also all the evil things that were attributed by the character by Le Fanu move forward because of that. There's another important feature in the novel regarding the relationship between Laura and Carmilla. They don't meet at the beginning of the novel. I mean, they, you know, I, I'm aware that most of you are familiar with the plot of the novel, but Laura is a girl that lives with his father and two governesses in Styria in a castle. Then one day there is um, a, 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 an accident and they had to take in a girl that's called Carmilla. They develop a bond. She's intimately a vampire and a gang of men had to kill her. Okay? So that's more or less the, a very quick summary. 
So the thing is that at the beginning of the story, we think that the girls are going to meet for the first time, but they don't. They really don't. Actually, they met when Laura was a little child because Carmilla attacked her. So there is this, and there is also the fact that both girls are related because they are both, uh, their lineage is the same, they are both Karnsteins. So, because Laura's mother was a Karnstein and Carmilla is Carmilla Gunther's Karnstein from Styria. So there is this quite disturbing feature of incest. There is an incestuous undertone in their relationship. And also the fact that actually Carmilla attacked Laura when she was like very little and then she is so interested in her. And in addition to all of this, there is a matter of reciprocity. I mean, we could actually uh, put a question mark. Reciprocity, really? Because it's something that we take for granted when we're talking about the novella. And um, when we read it for the first time, actually, we even could think, okay, yeah, there may be some reciprocity, but anal analyzing it closely, you realize that sometimes Laura talks about Carmilla in a very, like about Carmilla's advances, not about her because she actually admires her and her beauty a lot, which is the, um, con the big contradiction. Uh, the problem is that Laura, most of the time is very repulsed by Carmilla's advances. Like she's like, I hate it when you talk to me like this because Carmilla's had this rapture thing which is like mm, kissing her a lot and taking her hand in hairs and embracing her. And at the moment that was like a set between women because of romantic friendships, but it's even too much for the, for the standards of the time that Laura is repulse and she writes like I don't recognize myself when you do this when you say this when you look at um, me in this way and then there is the doubt doesn't she recognize herself because she actually feels something for Camilla or doesn't she recognize herself because she's feeling really uncomfortable and of course that may lead us to think okay so if she doesn't if there is no consent here we can see rapids overtones in Carmilla's attacks, which are something very like um, typical of vampiric attacks in general, but you know, next slide, please. So that's a very, very quick uh, like review of the, um, of the reception that the novel had uh, among lesbian uh, women. Daughter of Belitis was, was a very important lesbian uh, association of, uh, like during the, the 20th century. They thought that it was, Carmilla was a sub classic, but they thought of it as a classic, as a very important work for lesbian women. On the other hand, Terry Caso, which is one of the most important uh, lesbian academics that, you know, that worldwide, thought that it was a very overrated book and she refused to include it in her lesbian anthology. Um, so there was that, there was this like clash between the opinions, but then in 2019, Carmen Maria Machado, which is one of the most important Latino writers at the moment in the US, uh, wrote a prologue to the Lanterfish Press edition, which was, Mm, very popular at the time because she made the reader believe that the story was true, that the letters in which the story was apparently based had been found by Le Fanu and he had written the story in the way that he pleased, that he, that he wanted it to be, ignoring the real relationship between the women. And she wanted to make the reader reflect on the fact that that was a lesbian relationship, a story about a lesbian relationship, a sappy relationship written by a man, and that the male gaze had had an impact on the way that the story had um, been brought to us. And speaking of the male gaze, next slide, please. Carmilla's adaptations, cinematic adaptations in particular, had a lot of problems regarding the male gaze. First, there was the sexualization of the female characters, which is apparent in most of them, especially in the, in the Hammer trilogy, the Karstein trilogy uh, from the 70s. 
But there is also a fact that the vampire action is frequently witnessed by ma a male character. Like there is a man uh, all the time. In all, during all the occasions in which uh, Countess Karlstein in the Hammer trilogies, in the Hammer trilogies movies, do you know the times in which this vampire attacks other women? There is a man watching over her, which is a bit disturbing because we don't really, we, it's just like, it feels like very random, you know, like there is this man and why is he even here, you know? So it's like a personification of this gaze because there is, there was no place for the man in the bond that the girls shared in the book, even if it was uh, broken by men in the end because they killed Carmilla in the end, Laura's father. Um, and again, men killed Camilla in the end. But in the movie, this there was no reason for introducing a man watching over Camilla's actions in any case. And also there is the fact of the love interest, which is of the male love interest, which is very prominent, for example, in Blood and Roses by Roger Bailey, which is like, um, initially the girls were only interested in each other. So uh, putting a man in the, in the between them is like a way in which actually it could feel like, okay, the male director is trying to, um, looking for the male audience to empathize with the story in a way, to feel represented, which is actually something that makes no sense when we're talking about a sapphic movie, but you know, but, but a, a sapphic story. Next slide, please. And so in contrast to these previous adaptations, there was one in 1989 with, by, for Nightmare Classics, uh, it was a TV adaptation by Gabriel Beaumont that was regarded by Nina Auerbach as the best adaptation of the, of the time, uh, that actually had no male character, like no, there were no male love interests to start with. There were like, uh, there were like the uh, male characters, but they, they weren't an obstacle for the relationship between the two protagonists. And also there was the fact that there, was no sexualization at all. It was a very a beautifully written story uh, in which the two girls developed a bond. And, they, and of course, Carmilla was vampire, same as in the original story. But there was mm, a very clear difference between the way in which Gabriel Beaumont approached the work and the way in which male directors, which were the, the people that had directed the previous adaptation, had done so because of the sensibility of the way that the story was told and because of the way that the bond between the girls was developed. Next slide, please. So in 2014, five years before Carmen Maria Machado's prologue, actually, uh, the Guasi's adaptation of Carmilla air in Kinda TV, and it was a success. It was a transmedia queer web series. Um, actually, um, it was really successful because of the fact that it was a transmedia product, which are becoming very popular at the time. And the fans could interact with the characters, yeah, Tumble, Twitter, there was also a feed that they could read that, um, gave them another perspective on the story and a very important community grew. And the West series that they start as just one season was renewed for two more, one prizes. It was such a huge success, but why is it important regarding lesbian representation? As a light, please. This is going to be very quick because it's very easy to sum it up actually. The reasons why the West series was so important regarding lesbian representation would be the first would be that it featured really powerful female characters, a variety of them. It really passed Bester's test like in a wonderful way. Laura, which is the protagonist, is no longer a passive character. She becomes an active character. Mm, there is another love interest, which is Danny, the girl in the in the uh, on, uh, in the left in the image, and 
there's also the two governesses now are two um, like teacher like students in the in the university because now the story is based uh is takes place in a university in silas university actually next slide please there is also a theme that there is a naturalization of sapphic desire because as i told you laura has here two love interests which are Danny and Carmilla, and they are not afraid to express the attraction uh, towards each other. And um, also there is the fact that the attraction is not linked to the vampiric nature of Carmilla. It's not a vampiric thing, it's just something that naturally happens, which is like a huge difference regarding the novella. In addition to this, of course, the childhood memory is erased. There are no, uh, inceptions overtones because they are not related at all so all of this is spread it is um eliminated and last but not least this is like please um a very important feature of this uh was series is that in the original work uh, in the source work in carmilla uh the vampire appears to died at the end but in the web series, this doesn't happen in that way. I mean, they, they, they made us believe that she's going to die because she sacrifices herself for Laura and her friends. Like in contrast to the boat in which, you know, she dies because uh, Aganon men kill her because Laura's father and Aganon men kill her. Uh, there is this um, huge difference, you know, in the way that Carmilla Cate is portrayed. But the thing is that there is a trope, a TV trope that's called uh, by your gaze. Like there is a tendency to kill LGBT people in fiction in general, in audiovisual fiction. So the thing is that at the end, even if we think that Carmilla has died, she hasn't, she comes back and she manages to have a happy ending with Laura. I tell you they're kissing in that gift because that's a gift, but it's not working, but they should be kissing there. So. What I was saying to say is that there is a subversion of this harmful trope um, thanks to the decision um, that was made regarding the ending of the series. And they, there was one last slide. Next, please. So as a closing remark, I wanted to read to you like very briefly the last paragraph of my, of my master's thesis, which will be Carmilla, 2014, made history for being the first global queer transmedia phenomenon, but also because it reinvented a character that had never been stripped of its negative connotations, neither completely freed of the harassment of the male gaze. As Carmilla herself used to say, lot have its sacrifices, but it was about time that this started to change. And I think that this is what this West series managed to do. And it was the reason why it was so popular and it was so successful. And now, thank you so much for listening. And I am so sorry um, about like the freezing moment. Um, I, I'm so fed up on my PC at the moment. <laughs> thank you so much. So, yeah, um, let's, let's do that then. So our last presenter today is Gamze Ar. Uh, she's a PhD candidate in American studies at Ege University. She is deciding to study African American children literature for her PhD dissertation. Her research interests focus on American poetry, phrases, and gender studies. She is currently studying Ecocriticism, Native American literature, and Turkish American relations. And she is going to share her work today entitled The Analysis of Netflix Series Lucifer from the Perspective of Gothic Feminism. Thank you so much. Uh, let me share my presentation firstly. Um, thank you so much for this conference. I'm very happy to be here. Um, first thing I want to uh, say my um, abstract in order to better understand uh, the context. Gothic feminism is an authentic term for revealing the relationship between Gothic and feminism and the Netflix series Lucifer opens perfect dimensions to emphasize how women are merged with the supernatural elements in the series. The main character, Lucifer, is a significant figure in the context of creating the gothic feminist outlook in the series. 
And so it can be said that Lucifer is a great manifestation about reflecting fem feminist thoughts with strong figures such as Decker and Charlotte Richards. On the other hand, the evil side of the series um, affects audiences while creating fearful expressions. In the series, women sometimes seem as, as if they are vulnerable to men's hegemony or sometimes their behaviors lead them to be heroic status. And this presentation will explicitly present how the characters uh, reflect Gothic feminism and its main thematic approach. Uh, how did the main character, Lucifer, affect the woman? Why did he appear as a vulnerable Saturn against a woman like Decker? From which perspectives did the presentation shed light on Lucifer as a Gothic feminist genre? This presentation will try to answer these questions, and while examining them, it will be a great source for uh, Gothic feminism in American popular culture. Lucifer is a highly well-known series in terms of its authentic subject matter and thematic approach, so thus its relationship will be detailed examined within the uh, Gothic feminist theoretical aspect. In addition to Gothic feminism, Lucifer is also considered as a satanic feminism, and it will be explicitly seen in this presentation. This study will focus on three women characters, such as Mace, who is considered as the evil figure in Lucifer, Charlotte Richards, who is normally a woman, uh, a mother in the world, but um, is sometimes seen as the wife of God in the series, and Claudia Decker, who is an ambitious detective. Besides these women characters, there are also many other women characters, but this presentation will mostly explore these three women and their relations with Lucifer in the context of Gothic feminism. Um, Gothic writing emerged uh, uncanny and horrifying effects to carry its dark message. And throughout history, this genre is known as the embodiment of depressive desires. Naming the catastrophic nature of the world, widely attributed to Gothic literature, in infinite dilemma and supernatural results. Lucifer is a kind of holistic source because of emphasizing religious characters and motives. Luc um, in terms of this aspect, it is also considered as a satanic feminism, uh, in addition to Gothic feminism, in Lucifer, many women characters are trying to fight, fight for something such as love, friendship, or victory. In the modern world, women are always seen as fragile and vulnerable against men because the common world war causes the, this situation. The main character, Lucifer, is a Saturn and he is punishing evil people. He only cares about himself and his desires. Uh, however, in the series, he is vulnerable against Detective Decker with the interruption of the male god. In the series, women are obsessed with the uh, with his handsomeness and attractiveness, in that he's, um, he sleeps with various women. At that point, women are regarded as obedient and so sexual images against Lucifer, who is the representation of hegemonic men superior. The principles of Gothic feminism include both feminist ideas and Gothic elements. In terms of these multiple sides, Lucifer is a great example for indicating spiritual illustrations and gender issues. This study will focus on the woman characters, Chloe Decker, Mays, and Charlotte Richards, in terms of their examinations. Uh, at that point, religion is uh, the most crucial element for understanding better the context of Gothic feminism, as it always makes people doubtful and suspicious about everything. And because of this situation, the Netflix series Lucifer tries to create the atmosphere of Gothic with religious notions, such as Lucifer, God, or Satanic powers. Unknowingness is the most uh, significant element in Gothic feminism because of constructing the fearful and gloomy atmosphere in the minds of audiences. The main character, Lucifer, issues it with the question, what is your desire? Which reaches the darkest sides of people and it explicitly indicates Gothic nature in the series. Lucifer is also seen as a seductive figure of a woman, as a handsome and charming man, and he is the embodiment of evilness in the literal meaning, in that he deceives a woman in the series. It creates a huge irony with the idea reflecting that women are represented as defense defenseless human, human beings against men. And the feminist approach deals with this issue using significant woman characters. 
In addition to the religion, which de demonstrates the patriarchy with the dominant man's power, like priests, another interrupted patriarchal hegemony is God, who is the creator of everything. God is depicted in the man version, and he decides everybody's fate, including all women in the series. This description leads us to understand that men are presented as leading figures in every part of life, and Gothic feminism comes into the mind with the female Gothic, who is presented as a victim feminist, and this definition implies how women are victimized by the patriarchal practices in the world. From diverse aspects, such as feminism, Gothic, and gender, three women characters in Lucifer will be examined. And the first woman character being analyzed uh, in the study is the detective Chloe Decker, who is seen as a beautiful and ambitious woman. Decker is a complex character in the series as she is both victim and hero at the same time. Her first victory in life is seen with her job because she improves herself very well and she is known as a good detective in the workplace. From the feminist approach, Decker is manipulated with uh, the acts of men and it shows her vulnerability against men. For example, she is directed by God's will and her fate is determined by the male God who wants Chloe and Lucifer fall in love with each other. In the series, she first loves Lucifer with the interruption of God and later she likes Pierce who is Cain in Bible. He is depicted as muscular man and so from the gender point it can, it can be said that the series emphasizes how women like Decker are impressed with the physical appearances. It's a common motive using the feminist approach in terms of creating women's weaknesses via her fallacious decisions. On the other side, Decker is a perfect illustrator for stretching the idea of woman power with her am ambition and zealousness. She's growing up a child named Trixie, and it shows how womanhood comes with motherhood to level the essential duties of woman with its hair. And indeed, Decker is not related to the Gothic team, but she is a good indicator of feminism from both strong and weak sides. For her former artistic career, which is sexually attractive role in high top series inside Lucifer, is evidence that sexual appearance plays a crucial role in regulating the patriarchal society. Labels always push people into the categories which are mostly determined by male powers. And Decker is trying to hide her former career while working as a detective because she doesn't want that sexually materialist identity passes her real detective identity. With her strong and weak sides, Decker is a perfect role model from the feminist approach because she is always trying to be the best one in her job that is so hard and risky by catching criminals. And uh, another character is Maze. Maze is quite significant woman revealing the gothic features in the series. She is a demon and her evil behaviors create catastrophic mood that implies the gothic lifestyle. Despite her, um, all her stubbornness, she is a victimized and loyal figure to Lucifer in the series and it shows that women are always categorized as submissive creatures. Maze also emphasizes the oppressed side of woman because she's treated as if she is a dog of Lucifer. This issue can be examined in terms of feminist perspective in that women are presented with their incapability. Maze is always directed by men in the series. For example, she obeys and protects Lucifer, who is her supporter from the hell. And besides, she sleeps with many men like Emmanuel, who is an angel, and her desire for sex reflects herself as a horny woman in the series. From the feminist approach, Maze embodies the sexual materiality of womanhood in that she has a deep passion for sex in Lucifer. She is also betrayed by her close friend, the um, close, sorry, uh, psychologist Linda uh, in the third session. This betrayal in feminism can be considered as the insulting behavior because Linda and Maze are close friends and it harms their friendship. In the following parts of the series, their relationship is getting better, uh, but the most important issue is that they had a problem because of a man in their lives. Female suffering and victimization are two crucial points about emphasizing why the Netflix series Lucifer is a great projection of Gothic feminism.
Males at that point plays an important role to reflect the gender, gender and gothic elements together. Mays not only tries to survive in the world, but also wants to go to hell. In the third season of the uh, series, she attempts to go to hell as she fe feels to fail in life on earth. This disparateness integrates with womanhood, and it can be said that uh, gothic identity with Mays points out the victim feminism that is empowered with victimization and darkness together. From the feminist approach, um, it can be noted that she has a, a so strong character and she is always trying to create her, her new identity with her new friends and aims on earth. This process is hard for her uh, as she is far away from her home, which is hell, and she tries to adapt to, to the world. Her peaceful and friendly sides again indicate the adaptable womanhood, and it can be also commented in terms of feminist approach. Mays also enriched gothic feminism with her dark and horrifying mood like her knees and gestures in Lucifer. And my, my last character is the, uh, Char Charlotte Lichers. Uh, she is a key figure for both feminism and gothic genre because in the series, she is seen as goddess and an ordinary human being together. Her levels suggest goddess, mother or lawyer push her into certain categories. For instance, she always obeys some rules which are authorized by men like the male god and dominant men figures in the workplaces. It can be said that Richards is a victim of glass sailing that is constructed by society and world itself. As the version of goddess, she is seen that she escapes from hell and enters into the body of the Charlotte Richards. Thus, the audience should recognize her double um, identity. As the goddess, she is trapped uh, into hell by God. On the other side, Charlotte Richards is a successful lawyer, but not the first one. Therefore, Richards is also captivated by men-dominated society as a human being. She always comes across some interruptions created by men. For instance, she tells the psychologist Linda that her family is killed by men who is guilty in her dreams. The fear which results from Charlotte's subconscious strengthens the gothic uh, feminist side of Lucifer as the hell that is the representative element for gothic sources. Even this illustration summarizes that her subconscious is full of authoritative and dominant male figures. She was killed by gunshot of peers, who is Cain in the Bible, and this murder sheds light on the victimized nature of women and their disempowerment. This, this homicide implies the increasing number of uh, femicides all over the world, and so it can be a resistance against brutal manhood. Despite all weaknesses, Charlotte Richards is another strong uh, and ambitious woman with her successful career. Her successes suggest uh, winning a court cause and um, finding clues for catching the bad guys, prove her smart identity, and it is highly important to understand that Richards tries to achieve something in her life as the goddess or ordinary human being. It can be a good example for showing the endeavors of women to survive in life. Lastly, Richard tries to be a good person and go into heaven, heaven in her last time. In the series, because God is a male, the attempt of Richard is quite discouraging in the field of feminism. Everything ends up with the men's failures, and this notion implies how Lucifer uh, reflects the gendered practices while hiding messages in, inside itself. And all of these women are diverse representations in the series. For instance, the detective Chloe Decker is a strong woman with her weaknesses, such as being seduced or used by men. On the other side, Maze, who is an important character about constructing the gothic in the series, embodies both feminist and the gendered superiors with her uh, practices. And it creates dilemma with her double identity, illustrating goddess and badness. Uh, goodness and bad, badness together. In some aspect, she's considered um, uh, considered a strong woman with her struggle against men. And on the other hand, she is used by men like Decker in that she is a servant of Lucifer in the series. And gothic feminism positions its horrifying and idealistic notions within the aggressive womanhood like Mays, and it presents the victim feminism while defining the position of woman here. 
The third woman character, Charlotte Richards, is seen as a victim because of being punished by the male god. Thus, in the version of goddess, her resistance against god ma manifests feminism, and she also attributes the gothic genre with her supernatural powers in the series. And Charlotte is a successful woman as a human being, and her body is perfectly suitable for the goddess uh, due to having great magnificence. Having sexual implications and motives, Lucifer presents sexually in the borders of gendered perspectives, which are mainly about Gothic feminism and satanic feminism. Therefore, it can be said that this presentation indicates how the Netflix series Lucifer integrates Gothic feminism with satanic feminism coming from the biblical and re religious sides. With diverse woman characters, the Netflix series Lucifer projects on Gothic feminism from various thematic approaches, such, such as Gothic sexuality and gender, and all these issues are critical points with their hiding message, and three woman characters try to present their superiors with dominated male um, superiors together in almost every pile of Lucifer. And this is my biography just for information, and thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you so much, Ganse, for that very interesting presentation. And now we're going to move on to our Q&A session. Um, if our panelists want to come on, put on their camera. And we already have a question from Monica. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for your talks. Uh, and well, I'm that was back because I also have a question for her. Well, it's for everyone, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in, uh, in her presentation as well. And well, uh, yes, thank you very much for uh, continuing with your presentation and keeping calm considering what's happening. We really appreciate it. And I think it can make you really anxious. Uh, so I've got a question, well, it is for everyone. I was, um, I was very intrigued by, and I really liked it, the choice of works of, well, Rachel and Maya, uh, and well, the, the comparative uh, nature of all the presentations that you compare in different um, works or at least making references to them. And I, I would like to, to ask you if in, in the later works that you analyze that belong to the American tradition, and this is what our question, the question that I had for Alba, that I don't know if the adaptation is American or not, the web adaptation of the series, uh, so maybe you can answer later. Uh, so what I wanted to ask is um, if in these later works that uh, you examine and compare to the more original um, Gothic uh, works of the European tradition, if there is something particularly American that you can, that you can find because of all well, the scope of this conference at, and of our organization, are we interested in, in uh, tracing uh, yeah, also the more contemporary developments of the genre, but also what is particularly American. And you have all mentioned a lot of works, uh, but I don't know if you had some idea of some American um, anxiety or yeah, national trope, or, well, not national trope, well, yeah, national anxieties or anxieties belonging to the American tradition. Uh, that appear in some of the later works that you analyze. I think you've been just juxtaposing them to earlier works and how society has developed in the 20th and 21st century. But is there something um, also that you would like to stress uh, in these works? Like anything, anything is fine, just interested in general. Yeah, actually, I would love to respond to that real quick. Um, one thing in particular that I think really reflects more modern anxieties that is not necessarily as heavily written in the previous works um, is this idea of personal use value. Um, and in some of the books that I looked at, you could see this uh, kind of anxiety about um, kind of society as a whole. I mean, for example, Frankenstein kind of um, concerned about, well, supposedly concerned about uh, the good of the human race. Um, but then you look forward into something like Fifty Shades of Grey or like Twilight, and the concern is more of what is my personal use value to this person, to this monster, to this man, to this creature. So it's less in terms of um, 
of kind of like a broader scope and it's it's more putting more pressure on the female body and in terms of what is the female body doing for this one person in particular and is she useful enough for him um is something that i see reflected in in a lot of literature that's that's coming out recently as well thank you that that's extremely interesting thank you very much hmm. Shall I go next? Okay, so regarding what you asked, okay, the adaptation is actually, it's not American, it's Canadian. So there is that, okay? But um, you were asking about the tropes, about how, how we could, like the, the way in which it could be linked, all these adaptations could be linked with um, uh, American anxiety, North American anxiety. So, there is a very interesting point that actually uh, I am not sure I made about night, uh, like Nightmare Classics adaptation for TV. That adaptation actually is set on pre-war South, pre-war uh, North American, uh, American South. So it's actually, um, it takes place during the Civil War. And it was like, they, there is no apparent reason for the, like, that Gabriel Bobon had in mind regarding this, this, the decision to change the location. But I think it's quite interesting how she wanted to link it in some way to an American background so that the, the audience could feel like, um, could feel like more empathic regarding the action that they were going to watch so like the, um, the episode. I think that's worth noting. And there is also the fact regarding the trope that I was talking about, the bury your gaze trope. That's a very um, important trope in all American audiovisual fiction, like in general. Also, there was like a very famous um, incident regarding the 100 series, because uh, one very important LGBT character was killed instead of giving a happy ending. So I think that even if the series is Canadian, if addresses uh, problems that are present in US um, audiovisual fiction at the moment as well. And also there is, you know, there's this interesting feature regarding nightmare classics TV adaptation, which it is very like, very curious. Yeah, thank you. And, and of course that um, brought to my mind that in, in uh, in the case of projects distributed uh, through the internet, we also have to think of reception and and that of course makes us realize that we can uh, really continue talking in such restricted terms such as uh, just pertaining to the United States. Of course, like uh, what well, we American, we also uh, study in the intersections with uh, Canada, Mexico, and of course the American public um, is always very big. So I completely agree with you. It's completely relevant what you're saying. And uh, regarding uh, this work that it sets in the civil war, I find that incredibly interesting. I'll, I'll look into that, of course. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to comment or something, or I'll just uh, mute myself and disappear. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. I'll just thank you very much, uh, Rachel and Alba. Thank you for your question. Thank you. So does anyone else have from the public have a question? Or between yourselves, you can ask your fellow panelists if you have, do have a question. If not, I, I would like to ask you a question, actually. Um, I'll give more time to the public to think about if they, if they want to come up with something. So my question was, I think that something that uh, all your works had in common was this idea of um, the connection between sexuality and the transgressive, right? And how these trans transgressions were created somehow in the margins, especially in Alba Maya's and Rachel's presentation, all had to do with some form of fan fiction um, because of Fifty Shades of Grey specifically. And then I, I noticed that Alba also included, included Wattpad and Tumblr in, in her presentation. As, uh, and of course, the, the product that she was analyzing was a web series. And, and I guess this could be to a certain extent also 
um, extended, extrapolated to Gamsa's Lucifer because this is a series that works that it's on streaming and it, you know, this type of fiction works differently than it used to when it was something just on TV. And uh, you all kind of related these ideas to the male gaze and whether we needed more women producing this type of narratives and and this is, I think this is something that's very common in fan fiction, like women who write their kind of an erotic fiction in general, but especially, I guess, on the internet, because it's a, well, it's a freer space because anonymity and all these things that we know. So I was wondering if you had any comment on how this, this type of creations in the margins can open up um, these new spaces to maybe great to offer a greater challenge that um, these gothic narratives through these these breakings and um, I guess can offer or can can produce. Actually, um, before this uh, this question, I want to explain why I chose this one. Uh, I really love a Lucifer series. Uh, when I uh, saw it, I um, I. Uh, interestedly, interestingly, uh, watched all the series. And after I saw your uh, announcement of this uh, presentation, uh, I, I uh, recognized that I can combine Lucifer and the Gothic feminism together because Lucifer has some something about the, how can I say, sexual desires and also darkness inside. Uh, so it is a little bit modern version. Uh, when I look at the, by the way, all the presentations are great. I learned many different things. Thank you so much. Um, uh, actually, uh, my presentation is a little bit modern version, and uh, as you said, the male gaze. I, I just uh, took the gender studies in my bachelor degree, and uh, I'm not the proof of I'm not proof of this issue. I just look at this uh, this uh, Lucifer, the critical point from the uh, male gaze. And uh, from uh, in the modern uh, modern ways, you know, modern eye. So, be actually, I am not um, knowledgeable about the uh, how can I say fem gothic feminism in a detailed way. By this time, I try to read some books about gothic feminism, try to understand better the context, but I just. Uh, comment this issue in a modern eyes. Thank you. Oh, you are welcome. Alba, you wanna? Um, I wanted to add uh, something. I, it's not actually like an answer to what you said, but I wanted to uh, to tell you regarding what you talked, uh, what you were saying about the fantasy and the creation, uh, like merging some um, women creating. The Camila's was was so uh, like, they were so supportive of their women audience that they actually made the narrator of the fan fiction, which was an official fan fiction for the for the series. Uh, the narrator they chose um, a sappy woman to be the narrator of the fan fiction. So they, I think that they were actually um, familiar with this idea that you had about, you know women having to find a space to create and um, finding a free in a space uh, on the internet, you know? So actually it makes me think about this, um, about this problem that you just brought up. That maybe that was the reason why they chose Mary Ringo, which is the, uh, the name of the girl writing the fan fiction, the fan fiction, you know, uh, of the series. Like, I think that they were actually concerned that they were aware of this problem. So I don't know, just wanted to share because you actually made me think about that. Yeah, and I think this is this is actually very common in fan fiction, I think. And people, the way you explore your sexuality and this type of thing is it's very common in fan fiction uh, for LGBTQ people to include or gender bend, what it's called gender bending, right? The change in the gender of the characters that they like. Uh, in many cases to include more women because there are so many uh, narratives that don't have enough women so you actually need to change the genders or to include more more homoerotic content which in many cases also in, in mainstream content is there's not as much as we might like thank you um maya you wanted to add something yes i would like to add that in um 
new media artwork and electronic literature work of Doll Space by Francesca da Rimini, who is an Australian author. She created this space in which she denounced children pornography um, also those girls who died because of being born girls in, in Asian countries in, in the past. And she created the character of, uh, of the Yoldoko as the representation of women ghosts in history, representing that women have been ghosts because of the uh, invisibility in because of the patriarchal uh, society. And she, refer she received emails from people and she created this picture, which is uh, also a collective to denounce uh, patriarchy and she used gothic too um, and she there are quotations like all all women are ghosts and should not rightly be feared and also uh, Julia Chan in Brandon wrote about intersexual people and those who suffer from hatred and some who were even uh, raped or killed because of uh, hatred, and because of uh, their, because of being considered that they were um, uh, faking, and 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 yes, I think that uh, we can find in this uh, this type of transgression in internet stories, in as it is anonymous, as you mentioned, in some case they can also use. Um, pseudonyms, uh, Francesca de Rimini used many, Gash Girl, uh, Dol Yoko. And it is also a way that uh, it, it's a, it can be a genderless world. And also it can be a place uh, on the internet where there is no censorship and writers do not need an editor. So they can uh, express themselves in a more free way. Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I think that what you what you hint at as well, it's also interesting how this can go also the other way instead of being kind of a safe space in the margins where women can explore alternative narratives to the male gaze. This can also, you know, snuff and um, all these type of things that also emerge on the internet and maybe they are representing a, another darker path. Um, did, did you want to add something, Rachel, or? Um, speaking of this, the first thing that came to my mind when you talked about fan fiction that might be able to rewrite um, stories that have been kind of created underneath the shadow of the male gaze. Um, another collection that I like to look at um, in the same context as my presentation is Angela Carter's stories. Um, if anyone's familiar with those, she rewrites fairy tales um, and she she writes them in a way where even when the male gaze is present, she writes it as a critique. Um, and that's also been argued actually for work such as, um, such as Twilight and Fifty Shades of Grey, people have argued that because a woman wrote it, you have to read it underneath the lens of critique. Although I think that inherently making that statement is a little problematic um, because you have to question if it was written with the intention of critique or if it's written, um, and it just builds the gaze that we're already kind of living under. Um, and it kind of uh, takes more power away from the woman writer because she has to write underneath the lens of what's expected from um, the kind of hierarchy of control. Uh, but Angela Carter, I think, is one author that's really um, helpful in looking at her work when you look for someone that tries to use that trope, but to deconstruct it instead. Excellent. Yes, for um, talking about Angela Carter, because I was thinking about her too, uh, from the 40s, and it's true that she was able to criticize patriarchy and rewrite fairy tale stories to give them a feminist view. And uh, Rachel, I would like to ask you, uh, well, I would like to uh, congratulate everyone because all presentations were really interesting. Um, and also there was a lot of research, uh, innovation and feminist views. So congratulations, because I really enjoyed listening to all of them. And Rachel, I would like to ask you about the Dracula because I read it a long time ago and I don't remember where exactly uh, it was this uh, erotica you found 
and those women characters you talk about, could you explain what is it in which chapter of the book or pages or something like that? Because maybe, I don't know, it could be interesting to, to know it for students and all that. To come is that within class, Angela Carter? Something like that. Yeah. You mean within Angela Carter's work? I'm no, 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 sorry, excuse me, in, in Dracula, because you talk about Bram Stoker's Dracula, and yeah. you focus on a specific moment in which there is erotica, and I would like to know which chapter or page is it. <laughs> I would have to go rotate my, actually, hang on, I think I've got a page number written down here, let me sift through my note, but it's toward the beginning of the book, um, while Jonathan is still being held in the castle, um, that the three female vampires come and try to seduce him, which is written in a very erotic fashion. And hang on, I've got a page number here for you. At least in in my version, obviously the page number could be different, but it might give you a good um, little bit of a direction to go in. Here we go. <laughs> um, in my version, it's on page 45. So it is very early in the book. Um, so somewhere in that uh, in that vicinity of your book, um, it's where the three female vampires first show up. And um, that is where they have a, a an excerpt that is written that sounds very much like it could have been erotic fiction back in the 1800s. Which chapter is? I'm not sure. No, chapter. no, but it's a 45 page more or less, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So we have another question from Anna. Uh, yes, I wanted to ask this uh, to Maya and Rachel, as you touched upon Fifty Shades of Grey. And um, I think one of the most problematic uh, things, uh, clearly both the novels and the adaptation have is that uh, it, it really represents BDSM practices in a non-realistic way. It seems almost like a pretext to justify this abusive relationship that has actually nothing to do with uh, what is uh, safe and consensual BDSM practices. So uh, what do you think about that? I mean, uh, within uh, the realm of your of your study of it, uh, I was just wondering uh, how that fits with your analysis. How that uh, somehow comes through uh, your study of it. Would you like to start, uh, Rachel, or shall I go first? You can go first. I'll go afterwards. Okay. Uh... Well, when I read the novel many years ago, um, and I read it to criticize it because I was sorry it was going to be very sexist. And um, uh, I realized that, it, yes, of course, it was dangerous for, for young women to, to read a novel because there is a mixture of pleasure and romance with BDSM and the argument that everyone gives that, that as there is a contract and there is consentment, there shouldn't be any opposition to it. We should respect it and accept it. Um, however, it is true that we can see that the that the, the protagonist is completely, uh, she doesn't have any, any right to choose over her life, not only sexually, but also with her choice, with uh, her, her body and, and where does she go or anything. Um, and I, I think that it's, it's really dangerous because it is the, it is the message of, uh, yeah, it's a fame. It's a message to tell women to behave like girls forever, and also um, the problem with the BDSM is that we we always have different points of view, and some feminists, the left wing feminists, consider that um, that those who are considered 
um, against pornography or against BDSM are the conservative feminists. Um, because of historically, uh, Catherine McKinnon and all the feminists who were against pornography because they considered it degraded women. And also um, there was a book published about um, the famous case of, um, of the film of, um, yes, of this actress of, um, um, and, and and the, the the problem is that I think that uh, it is uh, it is not a a really healthy relationship style. Um, even if if it can be uh, quite uh, interesting and transgressive, and it can there there can be also an interesting way to to change the the roles the the conventional roles which can be interesting this is uh, uh, the interesting part of uh, sadomasochistic practices sadomasochism or masochism that there can be a, an unconventional way of uh, trying things but in the case of uh, 50 shades of gray uh, we don't have a, we don't have any any role change the the woman is always submissive and and this is why it, it is novel that um i think uh, we would rather um mm, uh, criticize it more than support it <laughs> i would okay. agree that it comes down to consent. Um, I think that in my reading of Fifty Shades, there is no consent. There is a facade of consent. Um, the problem is that this representation of BDSM still perpetuates this kind of normative masculine mastery over the female body. Um, and that's not to say that in these kinds of relationships that the woman has to take the place of power if she chooses not to. Um, but that's again, the key point is her choice. And in Fifty Shades, she has never written as really given a choice. It's, um, it's never starting with a, it's never written as started with a healthy relationship and then they have this conversation and come to these conclusions together. It's, um, it's Christian wants a relationship with Anastasia, but he will only take this relationship when it's underneath his terms. And she um, is written as submissive and giving into that. And then that's romanticized, the fact that she submits to whatever it is that he wants in order to have her. So again, it's she's only of use to him if she is, if she is being of use underneath his terms. Um, so I don't think that there is anything wrong with displaying uh, relationships involving BDSM in books, I think that that can definitely be progressive. Um, and I think that that can be empowering for both men and women, but it all depends on how it's portrayed and whether or not there is any kind of communication or healthy consent going on. And I think that's the issue in Fifty Shades that um, she kind of skirts around it by saying, well, there's a contract, but the way that it's presented, um, she was never really given a choice. Yeah, I absolutely agree because it, it really um, doesn't doesn't represent how that happens, which is usually something that you uh, decide. Uh, I mean, if you decide to have a contract, is something that you decide after a long time knowing this person, and that's something that is absolutely consensual. Meanwhile, in the movie, she's just thrown in, she's a virgin, which is something that would scare any BDSM practicer. I mean, that would never uh, do something like that. I think, it, of course, someone in their right minds would never do something like this with a person that has zero sexual experience. So I thought that it, it was really disturbing how that was represented. And on top of it, he, he is really a stalker. I mean, mm -hmm. he's a stalker, and that is not something that belongs to mm -hmm. safe and consensual BDSM practice. So um, I thought that it really 
did, um, I wouldn't say injustice, it simply misrepresented completely this. And I felt that it was somehow marketed as you know, for women who want to dream of a different kind of relationship, more transgressive, more transgressive, but they do not have, uh, I don't know, the courage or whatever, the opportunity to do that. But um, I think that also was a critical issue uh, because the public that was, this seems to be uh, aimed to aim that both the the novels and the adaptations i don't know it's kind of a I, I i even feel that the choice of the public is a little bit patronizing mm -hmm. it's a little bit you women uh unsatisfied uh sexually unsatisfied maybe i don't know cougars uh you will enjoy this this novel right but i think that that's offensive in a way mm -hmm. I don't know if you agree with me, but. <laughs> I absolutely agree with that. Um, it's, it's again, kind of projecting this expectation that if a woman is not being um, sexually satisfied, that almost like the only way that she could be sexually satisfied was if she was submitting properly to the male, not if you, you know, approach someone that you trust um, and talk about it. And the point that you bring up about her being a virgin, I think is incredibly important because not only does he um, desire this virginal body, but he desires to completely just devour her virginal body. Um, and I see that link between, I, I can see where it's Twilight fan fiction, especially in that way, um, because I look at how Edward stalks Bella and look at how um, Anastasia is stalked. Um, and then both of them uh, somehow get some kind of satisfaction, sexual satisfaction out of not being safe. Um, and then what, what exactly are you teaching your young female readers um, that it's sexy to not feel safe? Um, that's not only is that patronizing, it's dangerous. Hello, did you wanna add something? Yes, actually, I mean, I agree with everything that Anne and Rachel said, like the, the last comments about uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, but what I wanted to say was a very, like a little remark. For me, um, if Fifty Shades of Grey had no BDSN at all, like it was like not related, uh, for me, it would be just another movie, like another movie depicting a toxic relationship between a man and a woman, like there are tons of them, you know? So for me, it's like the BDSM was like the debate for people to just say, oh, wow, this is like something completely different. Wow, yeah, the hidden world of the BDSM. So it's like, no, this is not a correct description of BDSM to start with. And also this is another, this is another uh, rendition of the same old story. So it's like, there is, it's nothing new actually. And yeah, the, um, the, um, the promotion, like the way it was marketed here in Spain, oh my God, it was like, uh, it was disgusting. So yeah, yeah, I completely, I completely agree with everything that Anna and Rachel said. And actually I wanted to thank Rachel in particular for her presentation because I, I always had these questions in my mind about how uh, Fifty Shades of Grey was originally a fanfic based on Twilight, and now it's like, okay, there is this uh, power dynamic, and there's this thing here that I didn't realize because I was very young when I read Twilight. I don't know if I was 14, maybe, something like that, it, maybe even younger. So now that she, the moment that she said, okay, there is this thing with the male gaze, and they are looking nice, I was like, okay, it makes sense now, so thank you for that. Yeah, I th um, I, I'm going to add a little comment as well, because I think this topic is very interesting. I think it's also interesting on, 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 top, on top of what Alva was, was saying about how this is the trope of the toxic relationship and male, domina male domination fantasy type of thing. And not only is the 
the book without the BDSM, the atrobe relationship, but also it's the, I think it's interesting the fact that this existed in erotica for, for a very long time. Like, uh, uh, like romance novels with erotic content were targeted at women and this was something like, something that was not famous. The, the marketing had a lot to do with it because women were already reading this type of things and um, there are many romance novels with erotic content and rape fantasies type of thing from many years before this happened. And it was just a question of how, I guess that bringing it to the mainstream, connecting this with my question before about how this can exist in the margins as an exploration and kind of a female or minority exploration of some form of desire when brought to the mainstream, it's so, so diluted and so subverted in a, in a, bad, in a bad way. I don't know if anyone wants to add anything else or if anyone has any other question and if not I think we can close the session for today um, so I want to ask our public if they want to, to turn on their camera so we cannot properly thank our speakers today so thank you all for your presentations and for the very interesting discussion just now. And I hope you, you've enjoyed it and thank you so much.